Hi, I'm Lisa McLeod, Ontario's Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. On behalf of myself and my ministry, I hope you are enjoying a safe and productive Black History Month. Our government has been happy to support the Black History Society with annual operating funding because Black history is an important part of Ontario's heritage and should be both celebrated and promoted. Black Ontarians have helped build this province for centuries and have contributed greatly to heritage sport, tourism, culture, and every other sector of our society, helping to create what I call the world in one province. The greatest strength of our province is our diversity and inclusivity. And I hope we can continue to work together to strengthen our province even further. During the month of February and every day after, let's learn from the past to help create the best future for our province. Good evening and welcome to tonight's event. Black history marks these places. The work that organizations like the Amherstburg Freedom Museum Buxton Museum, Uncle Tom's Cabin Historic Site, and in my own writing, the Guelph Black Heritage Society do, is vital to honoring the legacy of Black Canadians. We cannot forget the past if we want to change the future. We must understand and appreciate the heritage of the Black Canadian community in order to address and break down the systemic barriers that persist to this day. And that's why events like these are so important in educating and inspiring current and future generations, while also celebrating and honoring the heritage of those who came before us. I'm so glad that these conversations are still able to take place during the pandemic. And I applaud the Ontario Black History Society for putting together such a great event and speaker series. Coming together as a community to share stories has never been more essential, even if it is through our screens instead of in person. I hope you enjoy tonight's event. Hi, Mayor John Tory here and I'm proud to recognize and commemorate February as Black History Month in the City of Toronto and I want to thank the Ontario Black History Society for offering community members a variety of programs as we celebrate Black History Month this month and throughout the year. There's no denying that the current times have been challenging and yet we continue to see demonstrations of strength and of ingenuity and creativity and resilience and resistance from Black Torontonians. And through this series we are celebrating a rich history and culture and the recognition of inspirational and talented individuals and organizations for their achievements in history, in the arts, in community services, and much, much more. All of these Heritage Months are about us getting to know more about each other. And this year, 2021, also presents us with the imperative to take the momentum of 2020 and harness it to make more progress than ever before in the fight against anti-black racism. 2020 brought to the fore the frustration and the grief resulting from years of discrimination and trauma. Now, 2021 offers the hope of better understanding and more action, backed by a strong public consensus and with your mayor as an ally. This is a must in the most diverse city in the world as we strive to make it the most inclusive city in the world. So to our black Torontonians, happy Black History Month. Thank you and enjoy the virtual, virtual speaker series. Good evening. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm Michael Thompson, the Associate Vice President of Strategy at TD Bank Group. On behalf of TD, I'm thrilled to, we're supporting this evening's Ontario Black History Society Black History Month speaker series event. The lineup across the month looks fantastic. This February is not just another Black History Month. We are gathering at a time when Black communities and allies around the globe demand that we confront the ongoing realities of anti-Black racism in all aspects of society. 
we must continue to push progress forward. When we launched the TD Ready Commitment in 2018, our goal was to support the conditions necessary for a more equitable tomorrow. Three years later, that commitment has put us on a path to help address inequities around social, economic, and environmental spheres. We continue to seek out better ways to support the Black customers, colleagues, and communities we serve today and into the future. Over the last year, we've invested more time than ever before in dialogue with community and industry leaders from Black-led, Black-owned, and Black-focused organizations. I've personally been pleased with the increasingly open conversations we're having inside of TD about the unconscious biases that hold Black employees back and TD's commitment to make tangible progress. We're embedding the lessons learned from these conversations into our institution, driving change and creating a better bank as we move forward. On behalf of TD, I thank you for supporting our collective learning journey with your presence today, and I hope that we get to celebrate Black History Month in person together next year. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Hello everyone, my name is Karen Brown, First Vice President with the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. It is my privilege to bring greetings on behalf of ETFO. First, I'd like to thank the Ontario Black History Society for organizing and facilitating today's session. The speaker series during Black History Month presents us with opportunities for self-reflection and renews our commitment to ensuring that increased awareness and knowledge about Black Canadian history doesn't rest passively, but leads to actions that work to dismantle anti-Black racism. Second, I'd like to thank each of you for your participation in today's session. Given the legacy and prevalence of anti-Black racism in colonial systems, institutions, and society that groups like Black Lives Matters have brought to light, we must do more to infuse Black excellence and Black Canadian histories into public education. We recognize that to enrich students' knowledge and understanding of Canadian history, we must go beyond the curriculum to also affirm and value Black and Indigenous people lives. ETFO is committed to creating policies, professional learning, curriculum resources that protect the rights of Black people, dismantle barriers, and ensure equitable outcomes for Black individuals. We acknowledge the urgency of this work and call on everyone to disrupt and eliminate anti-Black racism. I know this session will provide foundations for reflection, discussion, and social justice action. I would like to offer ETFO's sincere appreciation to OBHS and our speakers. Thank you again for your participation. Enjoy the session. The Black History Month Speaker Series would like to thank our sponsors. TD Canada Trust offers a range of financial services and products to more than 10 million Canadian customers, and the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario encourages a year long focus on Black history as an integral part of learning about Canadian history and current issues. Thank you for seeing our vision. We look forward to the future.
That was phenomenal. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Natasha Henry, and I'm the president of the Ontario Black History Society. I'm so pleased to continue our programming of our Black History Speaker Series uh, with our second event tonight, Black History Marks These Places. During the course of the evening, we are going to learn about four Black historic sites, and we will um, engage in a conversation uh, as we explore the sites and their significance. I wanted to first introduce, um, give a little bit of an introduction to each of the sites, and then we will go on to begin a bit of a profile of each site individually. I'd first like to introduce the Buxton National Historic Site and Museum, represented by Shannon Prince, the curator. The Raleigh Township Centennial Museum was officially opened in 1967 as part of the township centennial celebrations. The museum's purpose was to collect, preserve, exhibit, and interpret historical artifacts related to the Elgin Buxton settlement that was founded in 1849 to the late 19th century. A related purpose of the site is to provide the personal histories and genealogies of the original settlers of their descendant and their descendants through ongoing historical research. Today named renamed the Buxton National Historical Site and Museum in 1998, is currently owned and operated by the municipality of Chatham-Kent. The museum serves the inhabitants of Kent County and Southwestern Ontario, and also attracts visitors and researchers from across Canada and the United States. The second site I'd like to introduce is the Amherstburg Freedom Museum and curator Mary Catherine Whelan and assistant curator, Dr. Laureen Bridgen uh, Lenny. The, Afri the Amherstburg Freedom Museum tells the story of African Canadians' journeys and contributions by preserving stories and presenting artifacts that educate and inspire. The museum was founded by Amherstburg resident, Melvin Mack Simpson, on the belief that social, economic, and educational issues would be better addressed by society with greater knowledge and pride in its own history. After over 40 years of service and with generous support from individuals, foundations, corporations, and government sources, the Amherstburg Freedom Museum continues to be a national symbol of courage, determination, and freedom. The Guelph Black Heritage Society is represented this evening by Queen, the Executive Director. The, Black, um, the Guelph Black Heritage Society is in the building of the Guelph BME, that's the British Methodist Episcopal Church. It stood at that address, 83 Essex Street, since 1880. The Guelph BME was built by formerly enslaved Black individuals and their descendants who revived in the area via the Underground Railroad. The Guelph Black Heritage Society was formed after the BME Church was sold in, in November 2011. The purpose of the GBHS is to preserve the historical significance of the BME Church by creating a cultural, historical, and social center within the Guelph and Wellington County. The GBH's, um, GBH's offer to purchase the BME Church was accepted and it was finalized in 2012 December and the building has been renamed Heritage Hall. And the fourth site is Uncle Tom's Cabin Historic Site and with us this evening is Stephen Cook, the curator. The property that contains Uncle Tom's Cabin Historic Site is part of a 200-acre uh, land that was purchased in 1841 uh, to establish the Don Settlement, which was a, refugee, a refuge for the many fugitives from slavery who escaped to Canada to the United, from the United States. The Jujaya Henson Interpretive Center, located on the site, houses a collection of 19th century artifacts and rare books pertinent to the abolitionist era, as well as displays highlighting Reverend Josiah Henson's life. 
The collection includes a rare early edition of Josiah's autobiography and a signed portrait of Queen Victoria presented to him in 1877. At the Interpretive Center, visitors are ushered into the North Star Theater for a screening of a 30 minute video, Father Henson, His Spirit Lives On. The Underground Railroad Freedom Gallery recounts the history of freedom seekers from being taken from Africa and enslaved in the United States to finding freedom in Canada. The Central Station gift shop offers a wide selection of unique African and Canadian art and souvenirs, as well as an extensive selection of books. We are so happy to have these four historical sites with us this evening and their representatives, and we'll get into sharing some of this rich, amazing history of these sites. I first would like to get to um, Buxton, the Boston Historic Site, the National Historic Site and Museum, to share a little bit about their history. Ah, thank you, Natasha. Um, like you had previously mentioned, and I just want to make one correction because the municipality of Chatham Kent, they own the property and they own the building, but the museum, as the Buxton Historical Society, that owns the collection. Um, so we have our own autonomy, even though we're under that municipal umbrella. Okay? <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, we're very fortunate to have quite a few above underground railroad resources um, uh, from, from 1850. The settlement was founded in 1849 and it was uh, 9,000 acres and it was one of the largest uh, planned settlements that was established um, in Upper Canada at the time. Um, so we have a 1850 home um, that dates back on 1861 school, an 1853 barn, and an 1866 church, uh, which are just wonderful um, testaments um, to the to the people that arrived and have built. And because this was heavily forested land, you can almost imagine them clearing and building these, you know, everybody coming together as a community uh, to build the, their homes, their, school, their schools and the churches um, to educate um, and to um, teach religion. Um, so it's just fascinating. We also are very, um, privileged, I should say, to have some of those primary resource documents, um, such as collector rules, tax rules, uh, diaries and journals um, and wills and Bibles that date back uh, to 1849. And I really enjoy reading the, the diaries of, of some of the people. Um, and it's interesting to look at how the men view view what was happening within the settlement as opposed to the women. Um, the women go into more, um, not really gossip, but more detail as opposed to the men. The men are very uh, um, concrete, if you will. You know, get up, the sun was shining, took off, you know, uh, did 40 acres of hay today. They're very uh, <laughs> Point, point blank, if you will. But it's 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 really um, wonderful that we are able to have the collection that we do have. And I think one of the, the perks as a community, small community museum, is that it's a very hands-on um, and that we really encourage people uh, to come in. If you would like to, you know, pick up and read Reverend King's diary, uh, we do have it. So here, here's a pair of gloves, you know, have a seat. Uh, and it's just fascinating. So we're really honored uh, to have those documents in our care. Um, and we just, you know, we're just so blessed that we are able to continue the legacy that our um, our ancestors have left for us. Thanks for that. Um, just a little, if you can just tell a little bit about, uh, I think it's very briefly, just the journey. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I just Bri talk briefly about what? Um, just about the, the designation of Buxton as a historic, as a national historic site. Um, we were approached actually by someone from Parks Canada, Sh Shannon Ricketts actually, and we were designated as a cultural landscape. And uh, we, she did all the research uh, with assistance from Parks Canada. And the 
the material and that she uncovered and the research documents that she provided were, a, were another wealth of information for us. Uh, because of the landscape, because when people arrived, uh, uh, 50 acres were provided for those who arrived, but you had 10 years to pay that off at $2.50 an acre. So a lot of those plots were still in place. Um, the ditches uh, were still intact. Uh, we still use some of that drainage system to that to this day. Um, so it was 9,000 acres of this cultural landscape. And so, and I think when we were designated, one of the really, the highlights for all of us, I think, was was the fact that because it was during a homecoming weekend, and we have three three um, three plaques, and uh, because there was a big discussion on, <clears throat> excuse me, what should be on those plaques, and they incorporated all three. Um, there is a bell. Um, there's a. Um, a paragraph about the founding of the settlement and a map. So it's 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 wonderful. And and I think we were designated at the same time as down in Amherstburg, if I'm not mistaken. Um, right, Lorraine and Mayor Catherine? I know that there was there were several sites that were designated around the same time. Same and, time. And there, was, yes. there were maybe four sites I think that were designated yes. around the yeah. same time. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, and I and I think it was one of I think it was you know now they were realizing what has been left out, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. There were you know they designated places, other places, and in buildings, and they realized the fact that you know we haven't really reflected the whole um, scope of what Canada is comprised of, um, you know, the complexion. So now they're, they were looking at it, I think, through a different lens, understanding the fact, the contributions um, that Blacks had made. So I think that was one of those t opportunities. Um, and at that time, they um, acted upon it. Yes, and long overdue and part of the process yes. of um, acknowledging uh, and yes. some of these sites. It's, um, yeah. you know, Visiting Buxton is a is a is an amazing experience, and uh, the Ontario Black History Society, myself as an individual, I visited quite a, um, a number of times, as you know, and um, and we've organized some bus trips as well to bring visitors to to visit the sites, of, including Buxton. Uh, one of our, I think, our last trip was. Um, was uh, organized because we had a request, a, a, a nice persistent request of one of our, our members who has since passed, uh, unfortunately, mm. um, to to you know encourage us to to plan another trip for seniors to visit, um, you know, to visit Buxton and the Chatham area. And so you know, I, I, I mentioned that because you know that the importance and the, the the memories that people hold and make connections to these historical sites mm -hmm. are so, um, you know, are so important and so significant um, and, and markers in people's lives that it can't be, you know, it can't be understated. And, and so, yeah. you know, the work that, that Buxton does and these other sites as well are very important. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so I wanted uh, to, you know, to nice you picture. Know, Memoriam uh, of Claudette Talbot Jackson um, and her ongoing support again of you know the Ontario Education mm -hmm. Society and um, you know the other historic sites as well. Uh, we just wanted to to recognize that memory. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to uh, continue and to talk to uh, Mary Catherine and uh, Dr. Bridgen. Any to learn a little bit about the Amherstburg the Freedom Museum. Okay, so the Amherstburg Freedom Museum, you know, we consist of two historic buildings, uh, both from the time of the Underground Railroad. So we've got the Taylor Lock Cabin, uh, which is one once the home of a formerly enslaved person in his family, George Taylor, as well as the Nazari African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is also a national historic site. Um, the site also contains, our, you know, the museum structure, which houses the permanent exhibit and the cultural center, which is used for purposes of temporary exhibits, meetings, and rentals. And our core programming, you know, includes both self-guided and guided tours of these buildings and educational programming for schools and other groups. So, you know, showcasing these artifacts and exhibits, which tell the story of African Canadians. Um, you know, so so I don't know if you wanted me to go into the, the history of some of the sites. 
um, but the, the Nazarene African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, which was built in 1848, um, was, you know, it was a terminus of the Underground Railroad. So it was built by hand to serve Amherstburg's growing black community and the many people, um, you know, fleeing enslavement and the oppressed blacks that they felt, you know, tr true freedom here within, you know, the church's walls. Um, and the church itself is named after Bishop Willis Nazary, um, who led many congregations, including this one, um, from the American-based AME Church Conference to, you know, the new Canadian-based BME um, church. So, you know, the denomination, it flourished until the 19th century when, you know, many dwindling con congregations consolidated and, and reunited with the AME Church. Um, so this this church is, you know, it's important because it was a terminal station where where people could come and find refuge here after fleeing and escaping across the Detroit River by many means. You know, some people, they would walk across the ice in the wintertime. They would swim across the river, which is hard to imagine. Um, you know, if they're lucky, they could get boated across or maybe, you know, escape onto a ferry and come across. But they would seek out these places like the Nazarene Amy Church uh, for refuge. Um, and the church, you know, provided as much as they could, you know, to help people. So providing food, shelter, clothing, and obviously a place of, of worship where they could worship freely. Um, you know, so it's it's a very, you know, it's an evocative space that speaks to the faith of the Underground Railroad refugees and, and their commitment to build their lives here in Canada as, as free Canadians. Um, you know, and it's it's been designated as a National Historic, Historic Site since 1999. Um, and I don't know if Lorene, if you wanted to, you know, mention anything about the cabin itself or anything else that I've, you know, left out of the conversation. Um, you did a great job uh, filling it in. Uh, but I mean, in terms of the Taylor cabin, I mean, you'd mentioned it was uh, the home of George Taylor. I mean, that is such a historic spot. I mean, it is not only the, the home of someone who escaped enslavement, but also a Civil War veteran. And we celebrate that every day. And there's so much history in that cabin. I mean, it's not just about George Taylor, but I think it's about the community as well, because uh, the artifacts that are in the cabin are donated from local Black families. So not only are we celebrating George Taylor, we're also celebrating the families in the area who have contributed to the museum as well. That's amazing. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, let's learn a little bit more about uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin Historic Site uh, from Stephen Cook. Good evening. Well, hello, Natasha. It's so good to see you. Does my heart good to see you. We all are so busy for Black History Month and we don't, our paths don't always cross. So it's really good to see you and I hope everybody in the family is doing well. Um, oh, so Uncle Tom's one, Cabin Historic Site. One second, sorry, one second, Stephen. Just, um, one, sorry, I just forgot to show one short video of the, the Amherstburg site. And so I'll do that and then come back to you. Sorry, my apologies. Hello and welcome to the Amherstburg Freedom Museum. We're located at 277 King Street in Amherstburg, and this museum is in existence because of the amazing work and dedication of our founders, Mac and Betty Simpson, along with amazing community builders in Amherstburg and the surrounding area. My name is Lorene and I'm the assistant curator here at the museum, and I'm excited to give you a tour today. Hello, my name is Mary Catherine and I'm the curator here at the Amherstburg Freedom Museum. Uh, right now we're standing inside the Nazarene African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, which was also used as a terminal station for the Underground Railroad, one of many all across Canada. Slavery existed in Canada for over 200 years before it was abolished on August 1st of 1834. So that meant people were able to come and escape into Canada, they'd be considered free people once they arrived here. Amherstburg was seen as a really attractive place for people to cross over into Canada because it lies along one of the narrowest points of the Detroit River and it's not directly across from a larger city like Sandwich in Windsor is across from Detroit. Um, unfortunately, we don't know how many people came across into Amherstburg during the whole of the Underground Railroad period, um, but there was anecdotal evidence that after 1855, there were about 30 people crossing into Amherstburg per day. And at one point, there were more black people in Amherstburg than there were white people. Through the whole of the Underground Railroad, they estimate between 30 to 40,000 people came up through Canada. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly how many people came through Amherstburg, uh, but we estimate there are quite a number of people that came through here in this region. 
Um, many people did end up staying here in Amherstburg and building their lives here, while others continued on their Underground Railroad journey onto other black settlements in the region, such as the Buxton Settlement, which was known as the Elgin Settlement, and the Uncle Tom's Cabin Site, which was at that time known as the Dawn Settlement. This church, as I mentioned, was built in 1848 and was established by Reverend Noah C.W. Cannon, and the congregation began after that point to congregate here in the stone building in 1848. There are many different ways that people would cross the river into Amherstburg. Um, some people, if they were lucky, they could get boated across by an abolitionist. So that's someone who was risking their lives and their livelihoods to help bring people across to freedom into Canada. Uh, some people, well, they would maybe stow away in a ferry that was leaving from Ohio or Michigan or even board as a passenger on those ferries and come to this region. And in most extreme cases, uh, people did actually swim across the river, which would have been really dangerous to do so because the rushing current. The river itself is not as deep as it is now, but it would have been really dangerous to cross because of that current. In the wintertime, people would also cross the frozen ice into Amherstburg, and some people would cross over onto Bablo Island first before coming into Amherstburg. Hello and welcome to the Amherstburg Freedom Museum. We're located at 277 King Street in Amherstburg, and this museum is in existence because of the amazing work and dedication of our founders, Mac and Betty Simpson, along with amazing community builders in Amherstburg and the surrounding area. My name is Lorene and I'm the assistant curator here at the museum, and I'm excited to give you a tour today. Hello, my name is Mary Catherine, and I'm the curator here at the Amherstburg Freedom Museum. Uh, right now, we're standing inside the Nazare African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, which was also used as a terminal station for the Underground Railroad, one of many all across Canada. Slavery existed in Canada for over 200 years before it was abolished on August 1st of 1834. So that meant people were able to come and escape into Canada. They'd be considered free people once they arrived here. Amherstburg was seen as a really attractive place for people to cross over into Canada because it lies along one of the narrowest points of the Detroit River and it's not directly across from a larger city like Sandwich in Windsor is across from Detroit. Um, okay, thank you. So that was a brief um, uh, snippet of a tour, a virtual tour of the Amherstburg uh, Freedom Museum. Um, so I'm going to now move on to uh, Stephen Cook for you to introduce um, Uncle Tom's Cabin Historic Site. Thanks, Natasha. Uh, so I'm broadcasting today live from uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin Historic Site in Dresden, Ontario. Um, the museum has the last house that uh, Josiah Henson uh, over my shoulder here that he lived in uh, from circa 1850 till his death in 1883. And for those that don't know, a brief snapshot of his life, he was born into slavery in Charles County, Maryland and escaped from Kentucky where he'd been sold, came up to Canada on the Underground Railroad uh, six week journey with his wife, Charlotte, and their four small children. They crossed into Canada up at Fort Erie, and they originally settled there for about six, seven years, and then went down Windsor Way, where there had been quite a large gathering of uh, other refugees that were coming into the province, uh, as Mary Catherine indicated earlier. So they stayed there for about seven years on government tracts of land, but Reverend Henson wanted to benefit from the labor that they were putting into the land. So a conference was called in London, Ontario, of the leaders from within this part of the province, the black leaders, and Josiah and a missionary by the name of Hiram Wilson were uh, tasked with canvassing all of southwestern Ontario to see where would be an ideal place to settle. And they came across the wonderful fertile land here in uh, Dresden, the beautiful Sydenham River that was uh, going through the cutting through the land and decided this would be the ideal place to start up what they uh, referred to as the Dawn Settlement. And so in 1842, 200 acres was purchased at $4 an acre and it grew to 300 acres. And what's really interesting is that 
the settlement was started with the name of the British American Institute. So a school was built on that uh, 300 acres of land, but these settlers that came up from the South, they didn't live on that land. They bought land around the perimeter of it, and that's what became known as the Don Settlement. And it attracted over 500 refugees from fleeing from slavery in the United States who came here to Dresden to start new lives for themselves. And Josiah was really their spiritual leader because he'd become a, a minister when he was enslaved. So he lived out the rest of his life here um, as a, a builder, a, a, a leader within the community, um, an entrepreneur, a businessman himself. And he became known as Uncle Tom because Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, she released that in 1852. 1.3 million people bought it the first year. And of course, when something's that popular, uh, controversy soon followed and people said, well, this, this story that she has uh, created is, is just made up from this woman from the North. She just created it out of her mind. So Mrs. Stowe wrote a book a year later called A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it was in that book where she first uh, indicated that Josiah Henson's memoirs, which he published in 1849, they provided her with the, the background for the character of Uncle Tom in her novel. So being a shrewd businessman that Josiah Henson was, he would travel England and the Northern Free States and here in Canada, as well as the real Uncle Tom. And he knew that that connection to the book would draw attention to the settlement here in Dresden. So he lived out the rest of his life um, here on the property. He's buried right adjacent to the house where he lived in. And it's part of the tour here at the museum, as well as two other buildings, uh, a sawmill uh, structure, and of course the main center, the Josiah Henson Interpretive Center, which houses the, the Underground Railroad Gallery and the North Star Freedom, which as you said earlier, we, sh we show a orientation video to give people a little bit more background on his life. So that's in a nutshell, great. that's the history. Yeah. Thank you, and we'll go to a video that shows us a little bit of this uh, magnificent historic site. Welcome to Dresden, Ontario. I'm Steve Cook, and I grew up in this small town. It's a rural farming community with a population of about 2,700 people. Of that population, there are roughly 10 to 12 black families. That's today. But back in the 1840s and 1850s, over 500 blacks were drawn here because they heard something exciting was happening. A school for refugees from slavery had been built in 1841. It was called the British American Institute, and around it developed a community known as the Dawn Settlement. The man behind the vision for the school was a refugee from slavery himself. His name was Josiah Henson, and it's his story and the story of these other refugees from slavery that we tell here at Uncle Tom's Cabin Historic Site. The museum is owned and operated by the Ontario Heritage Trust. We preserve, promote, and share Ontario's rich heritage. And it's Josiah Henson's story I'd like to share with you today. So we're now in the Josiah Henson Interpretive Center. This room is called the North Star Theater. And it's in this space where we talk about the African diaspora and trace the personalities and events from 3000 BC to the present day. Josiah Henson was born into slavery in Maryland in 1789. He was soon thereafter put on... Thank you for that uh, brief video. Uh, and we will definitely be sharing where you can access these videos um, at the end of the event. I wanted to uh, move on to the 12 Black Heritage Society and allow Queen to introduce this great historic site for us. Hi. Hey, Natasha. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. It's such a pleasure to finally meet you and um, all these wonderful panelists today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about the Guelph Black Heritage Society. You gave us such a beautiful introduction, educating us on the space that it is known today as Heritage Hall. Um, as you spoke of, Natasha, 
The Heritage Hall was built in the 1880s by former enslaved people who escaped through the Underground Railroad coming up here. Um, what's so, you know, interesting about this particular area is that this wasn't necessarily a stop on the Underground Railroad. It was necessarily used um, for a safe haven, for social life, for education, for a Sunday school. It didn't necessarily have a tunnel connected to it, which like most locations, um, we have some history that ties to those things. So it's really interesting as an establishment in Guelph and on this Queensland that we stand on, that we were so lovingly um, given land from our indigenous brothers and sisters as a black population in Guelph to live and work within Essex and Nottingham area. And this allowed us to work within the local stone quarries, which is really intriguing to know, you know, majority of our buildings within the 1800s were built by our black ancestors. Um, and, you know, as the population did decline, as we have seen with many of these locations, it became a Baptist church and so on. It so moved forward into what we know now as the Heritage Hall, which is not only a hall, but a safe haven and an educational tool and spot um, for our black and indigenous and people of color right now. Um, it's such a beautiful historic building built with beautiful limestone, with lovely chimney work, with, you know, Freemason markery. There's just so much intriguing education that comes with the building itself and the architecture, let alone what's happening inside and outside of that building. That's amazing. Thank you so much. We're going to go to a video where we will actually get to see just a little bit of um, the Heritage Hall. Thank you. Welcome to the Heritage Hall, owned by the Guelph Black Heritage Society. This structure was built in 1880 as the Guelph British Methodist Episcopal Church. As you can see above the door is a plaque. This plaque reads BME Church 1880. At the right front driveway corner, if you look four blocks up, you can see the stone mason's mark. It looks like a backward seven on a shield. In 2012, the Guelph Black Heritage Society purchased the church to preserve its historical significance and to create a cultural, historical, and social center for Guelph and Wellington County. To recognize this vision, the building was renamed Heritage Hall. In 2013, it was designated by the City of Guelph as a building of cultural heritage value for its link to Guelph's historic sand culture association with Black history, its architectural merit as a fine example of Gothic revival style, and its contextual presence within the historical settlement area of Guelph's Black population. The Freedom Project was completed in 2020. This project allows universal accessibility into the Heritage Hall. This addition includes a wheelchair ramp, vestibule, and accessible washroom. The glass block tiles at the back of the building spell out the word freedom in Braille. The Heritage Hall was made to seat 300. The original congregation was only 40 people and they would have sat in wooden pews. There is original glass from the 1880s at the top of the windows you see. A podium still exists from the 1950s with Gothic moldings and sits right outside in our hallway. This newly refurbished space is the Heritage Hall Theatre. In the words of Denise, our president, it is a place for creating opportunities for emerging minority and marginalized voices to explore their stories and to find opportunities to share them in the Canadian arts landscape. The Heritage Hall provides space for live events. In addition, with new equipment, it includes a portable stage, seating, lighting, and sound equipment. New to Heritage Hall is an AV equipment setup, enabling virtual events to be broadcasted in the newly renovated space. The building is currently used by faith and community groups to host their meetings and services. In order to honor our ancestors, a mosaic tile art display, which depicts nine of the Underground Railroad quilt code patterns, has been installed in the foyer of the new addition at the back of the Heritage Hall. The Underground Railroad quilt code patterns contained secret messages that helped direct slaves in their journey to a free land in the 1830s.
Great, thank you for that. Um, you know, just taking a look at these four sites, um, you know, these are amazing sites and really markers, as you said, markers of Black history. These places um, locate Black presence um, in the physical spaces in these communities, but also obviously highlight the, the histories, the experiences and the contributions of Black men and women to the communities where they resided, where they lived, where they built their homes and raised their, their families. Uh, and so I wanted to thank you for sharing a little bit about that history. Uh, I'm going to go next to a, a video, our, our campaign video, Black out history because afterwards I want us to talk about the connection to these sites and to public awareness and education. Our video, uh, Blacked Out History, it was intended to represent um, the ways that, uh, as a visual, the ways that Black Canadian histories are uh, marginalized or, or some reduced or even excluded um, in, in the curriculum, in textbooks, and in classrooms, and really to ignite, reignite the push for mandated learning expectations in the Ontario curriculum. Uh, we know that what teachers teach um, in the classroom, they choose what to teach or, in regards to Black Canadian history. And we know that uh, many teachers do just a phenomenal job um, to do this and to, to, to do the important work in rectifying that erasure. Um, but we also know that there still needs to be work to be done in this regard to bring some of this history into all classrooms and more classrooms in all classrooms. So I wanted to connect this to the, you know, to the, each, each of the sites and um, allow you to talk about how our schools um, using or not using, should be using your sites, um, you know, recent, more recently through to today. I'll start with Shannon. <laughs> you seem so eager to say something. <laughs> Unmute. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I've seen a really, it's, it's um, um, almost like a curve, if you will. Um, there, you know, you're trying to get schools to come to you for tours and uh, you go to them. There's so, there were a variety of issues, you know, first you have the busing, uh, not enough, um, um, and then, and then it was just strictly come to come to do come to our school for Black History Month, and then teachers would get upset if you weren't available when they wanted you to come, uh, even though I explained, you know, we can do it. Uh, <laughs> any month, any day. We don't just have to do it in February. So that was, that changed. And then we did, we uh, at the museum quite a few years ago, we did some programming attached to the curriculum with the achievables, uh, the outcomes uh, for different grade levels. And um, that, and it, that was quite successful. And we still have some of those um, uh the, some of those educational kits that are still online that teachers can access. access. Um, but I think there has been a, a real um, urge, an urgency now um, for 
teachers to uh, because of that because they want to want want to more know want to know more, and and I think it's all since Black Lives Matters to me uh, with it just within the last the last year now uh, I think it's I we want to know especially what's in our own backyard and now you can see that some of them are feeling wow I didn't realize that this was here right in their own backyard you know they're traveling to go out someplace you know like for field trips you know they might go <laughs> to the cn tower wherever uh where where as they could come and explore what we have and uh you know you're it's an educational entertaining at the same time uh but it's but i i see that they are doing they want more and i think be, with covid now i'm finding it um for me personally um harder only because it was easier if I went to a school, a certain grade, I can take whatever I needed uh, because I like to engage with the students. So when you're doing a Zoom or whatever you know program you're on, you can't see the students. So it's not it's not personable to me. You lose that that uh, that engagement. So you don't know how they're reacting. You know, if somebody is like you know, uh, and you want to address something, they don't understand, you just want clarification. So I think it, it, it's really, uh, um, it's hard now, uh, but I, I do think that when people will be able to come to visit, I know they will come. Um, and it's just through, you know, either reading something or seeing something, but now they they do want more. They really, really want it. And I think I just saw that your um, campaign for the first time um, and I love it. So I think, you know, now is really uh, an important time for all of us to get on the bag, bandwagon, if you will, and really um, petition, um, you know, the government, whomever, to say, yes, this needs to be included. You know, not just a line, you know, what the Underground Railroad is, what an abolitionist is. You know, we they need to know um, this history, this Canadian North American history. Uh, it's so, so important. It's in, and it, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, thanks for the, you, and you mentioned a couple of, you know, important points that um, visiting these sites are viable, um, important close options for field trips for experiential learning. And I'm going to get Mary Catherine to talk about Amherstburg Freedom Museum. But one thing that I do is I'm always fascinated to see schools from the United States coming to some of the sites, some of your sites to visit. Um, so think about the hours of travel and they're even staying overnight, um, you know, to enjoy all of the sites cl in close by. But then, you know, in terms of, you know, in, in the Ontario vicinity, I don't, I haven't seen that response take that similar response and engagement with the sites. Um, so Mary Catherine, what, what um, in regards to your site, what has it been like in terms of engagement with schools? I mean, before COVID, like, I, I feel like we had a lot more um, positive responses from from the Catholic schools. You know, we we're getting a lot more of the Catholic schools that were coming out and making the effort to come out here to our sites. Um, you know, we we supply the information packets to the teachers, you know, all the, you know, all the schools in the in the region um, to book the tours, but ultimately it's the teacher's decision to book the tour and not, you know, just during February. Um, so, you know, major complaint like as Shannon mentioned from teachers is the the cost of busing the students and often the teachers they will group together a tour at our museum with a tour from another site that's in Amherstburg just to make it cost efficient um so you know and then we don't get a lot of high school classes but you know it's it's mainly if we do get that kind of age group it's mainly history clubs ESL or programs through United Way um so our main you know group that come here are the elementary students um and and just again, based off what Shannon said about, you know, the students actually being here at the site or being able to interact with them is like a huge portion of, of doing a tour here. And depending on the age of the student, you know, we have activities that tie in with the curriculum, including scavenger hunts and Kahoot games that require the students to, you know, recall what's taught to them during the tour. And the younger kids really get excited about doing the scavenger hunt because, you know, they're having to explore the sites, the, the site themselves and you know, ask questions and 
you know, learn from themselves, you know, to, to answer these questions. And, um, you know, and while well, the other, the older kids, you know, they like the technology of the Kahoot games. So, you know, that's kind of what we experience here uh, with our educational, you know, our core educational programming here at the Amherstburg Freedom Museum. Oh. And like you mentioned, you know, we were getting, uh, you know, before the pandemic, we were getting schools from, you know, uh, even as far as, you know, Chicago that were coming here every year. Um, to to come and experience the site and to learn about the Canadian side of this history. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Before I get to Stephen um, to talk a little bit about <laughs> what's been going on there at, at uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, I want to mention that you know each of these historical sites also have resources and information on their websites that are really great um, materials for teachers and for students to use um, as well. Uh, so Stephen, I know that you have been doing uh, some work with your local school board uh, specifically, but also I know that you have you know, other schools engaging uh, as well. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, yeah, and something that you said earlier really um, uh, brought back some memories. Uh, I grew up here in Dresden and Uncle Tom's Cabin is about a kilometer and a half away from the public school. And we didn't come here. And it wasn't until going away to university and studying on my own that I realized there's so much black history here in Dresden. When we grew up here, we thought, you know, there's an old museum with some old artifacts in it. And that's really how the story was told back in the 1960s and 70s. And it wasn't until the 1980s when the great, great granddaughter of Josiah Henson got involved in the museum here that she turned the story around to focus on the black history narrative, which is what the site is all about. So it was really disappointing to discover that, uh, you know, when I'm in my late teens and, and becoming a young adult, that it, it kind of was like a sense that this, the history was stolen. It just wasn't taught to us. So that really, when I got involved, here at the museum, that has been my number one goal is the education factor. And um, I'm really, really pleased. Today was the very first day for uh, the release of our lecture with Canadian author Essie Dugin. And she wrote uh, her most recent book is um, Washington Black. And so she did a lecture for us and that debuted today. We thought maybe we would get 1,500, 2,000 students to watch it. Today, we have over 500 teachers and over 16,000 students that are gonna be watching that lecture. And it's, it airs today, and then there's another broadcast next week on the 23rd. So if people wanna register, they still can by going to the Ontario Heritage Trust website. So that's really encouraging. And then Natasha, as you know, we engage uh, Ms. Henry, Ms. Natasha Henry, as the uh, leader of a Teaching Black History in Canada workshop. And we did that for, uh, we've done that for three years now. And we, we really had the ball going, didn't we, Natasha? And then yes, COVID yes, hit. Well, COVID and hit. Miss my trip to to uh, to Buxton and to and to Chatham. <laughs> well, I'm going to put yeah. you on the spot now. We did weren't able to do it last year, but we thought maybe this time around we'll do it earlier. We would always do it during Black History Month. Let's do it in the fall so that the teachers have those resources that you share with them here at the museum, and then they can be prepared for Black History Month. So, uh, Natasha, let's talk about doing something a little bit earlier and maybe virtually so we can reach broader than, than just here in the Chatham-Kent area. Uh, yeah, and thanks for that. You mentioned two things um, that we can and should be teaching uh, integrating Black Canadian history throughout the year, not just in February. And, um, and you know, looking at the importance of visiting these sites for black students um, and what it does in terms of their sense of location and belonging to physical spaces and, and marking you know black history in the province and even in their local communities as well if they're nearby uh, but also it is, is also important for uh non-black students to, to to understand and to recognize and appreciate 
the, the, the extensiveness of a black presence in these places. And so one of the things that I, I have done in, in my work is I've um, tried to model for educators the importance uh, and the, the, the benefits of visiting these sites and have led some, edu some tours for educators as a way to model you know, how they could visit either if it's one day, if somewhere close by or plan a well-planned out tour to visit you know, uh, Essex County and then come to Kent County, but it can be and it should be done. Uh, and so I think, you know, it's important for us to continue to share that and to let places, educators know, both public and Catholic school boards, private schools, that these, um, these sites are available to visit. Um, Queen, what has your uh, experience been like with um, schools and teachers and students? You know, I think what we see, we're a little bit different at Wealth Black Heritage Society as we're not necessarily a museum. We were just such a huge monumental landmark for the city. And I think with in light of, you know, the murder of George Floyd and the BLM movement, um, people have really started to see us and started to acknowledge us, not just as a heritage hall and as an organization, but the community members that are in this city. And it's so evident that people want the education and people want the knowledge. We're so lucky to work with educator Lorraine Harris and create some curriculum called A Place in Our World that will be um, implemented ideally into the schools, whether that be you know, kindergarten all the way up to high school. But just like you said, taking that opportunity to take black history and heritage, not only in this month, but throughout the year, throughout the year, pardon me, you know, because I am black, not just today, but every day of the year. And we have to acknowledge that that applies the same for our students. And I think what we're seeing is that our youth are becoming so robust in the way that they want to learn, whether it's on platforms like online or whether it's, you know, events that are in person, ideally, hopefully getting back to that space. But they're taking in this knowledge at a different rate and they want to, youth want to see a different change than we've seen in past generations. They want to make noise. They want to be able to challenge the the systems that be and see a more intersectional space and that includes the education so um, it's been a very popular time for Guelph Black Heritage Society and education seems to come right along next step between the museums the libraries the schools and just our regular community members mm -hmm. that's great to hear thanks for sharing um, I wanted to ask each of you, uh, you, you mentioned it a little bit uh, in your responses around schools and school visits and engagement with the um, educational system. Uh, how have you been coping with and adapting to the realities of the COVID um, pandemic uh, to remain, I guess, accessible to the public and to you know, your, your operations in some way um, you know, how has that been going? I'll just could go back into the same order and just begin with Shannon. <laughs> She's making me laugh. <laughs> go ahead, Shannon. Gee, thanks, I Natasha. <laughs> um, again, I, this has been very challenging. I guess one of our, our biggest um, uh, challenge at the museum is our internet we don't have it's not the strongest so uh, unfortunately because a lot of uh, places between schools and in businesses they would like a virtual tour um, of everything and we can't so we're in the process now of doing some mini um, mini tours that were of some of the exhibits that we're going to record and post um, but also because um, uh, some of the different um, programs that people are using. Some are using the Teams, the Google's Meet, and the Zoom. And again, I have difficulty accessing the, um, those programs of, uh, of through the museum and the internet. And then trying to do a, whether it's a PowerPoint, something, something engaging again, because you are online, uh, you know, you're talking to ho however many students or staff. Uh, and again, there's that not engaging engagement. So trying to keep that interest that um, focus for for them to really understand what you have here and the significance and importance of it. Uh, uh, so with that is hard um, and for different ages. So it, it has been it has been quite challenging for for us anyway. But 
always, you know, you always do it in the end, but, but it has been, it's been difficult. <laughs> and I guess because there's, you know, a lot, um, yeah, between uh, myself and the assistant, and probably everybody has is under that same umbrella, trying to um, do so many projects. Um, and again, Natasha, I think we're all like you. We don't know how to say no, um, so we have uh, more things sometimes that we can fulfill. So yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Thank you, Shannon. Lori, <laughs> how are things? over at Amherstburg Freedom Museum. Uh, so we've uh, really uh, tried to adjust to this new world that we're living in. Uh, we've been um, giving uh, virtual tours to not only schools, but corporations as well. Um, thanks to the generosity of the OBHS uh, helping us uh, create the virtual tour that was presented at your kickoff, we've been able to use that and do question and answer periods at the end um, so that there's more of a presence for us and it's not just them watching a video. Um, we've also tried to engage people uh, with doing online events as well. Uh, we did our 45th anniversary last year. Uh, we did um, also Christmas at the museum. Uh, we do have an upcoming event in April, so make sure you stay tuned for that um, on our social media channels. Also, we've had fundraisers as well too, just trying to keep people engaged in as many different ways as possible. And also as the person who manages our social media pages, I've always treated our social media pages as a classroom as well. Uh, and so not just having virtual tours, but also continuing to educate people and broaden our audience in terms of our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram page, and also TikTok uh, recently as well for anybody who's on that. Um, and I mean, one particular example we have is is trying to use our, our social media as a classroom is uh, the Facebook Live presentations that we uh, created. And that actually came out of the pandemic. We had originally had uh, a guest speaker scheduled to speak in May, and then the pandemic happened. And so I reached out to her um, because she lives in, she was, uh, she's a PhD student. Her name's Maria Esther Hammock. She's phenomenal. And uh, she lives in uh, the United States. So she had to go back to the US and couldn't do the presentation in Canada. And so I asked her to do the presentation uh, on our Facebook page. And that's what started uh, our Facebook Live uh, Black History presentations uh, to get going uh, was because of that. And uh, we've had uh, one presentation each month since May of last year. And our most recent pres presenter was uh, Dr. Charmaine Nelson, which was very exciting for us. And we've also um, additionally tried to have increase our collaborations. I mean, it's been brought up many times by the panelists uh, correctly that the Black Lives Matter movement has has increased uh, people's um, uh, the, increased the amount of times that people reach out to us to to work with them, collaborate, share information. And so we've also been trying to do collaborations as well. Uh, Mary Catherine mentioned how the Catholic School Board has uh, been supportive in terms of uh, tours in the past and the Public School Board as well. Uh, but we also had um, many collaborations in terms of the, the Catholic School Board. We've also had uh, the Tourism, uh, Tourism Windsor Essex, uh, visit Amherstburg, uh, the River Bookshop. We just recently hosted a presentation with Bernice Carnegie, uh, who is the daughter of hockey hero Herb Carnegie. And that was a really moving presentation. And so the more opportunities that we can have to, uh, to uh, I guess, increase our classroom, um, I think that we need to, to see the museum as not just a physical space, but also an online space as well. So we've been really trying to adapt um, through those methods. Oh, great, thank you, Lorraine. Uh, Stephen, how has uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, fared with COVID and adapted to the restrictions? Uh, challenging to say the least. I don't think any of us realized that we'd have to become videographers and sound technicians and lighting experts throughout this process. But uh, in creating all this uh, online content, we have to wear all those hats. So it's it's been challenging, but it's been a lot of fun. We've really enjoyed it. Um, and Shannon, you and I are gonna kick ourselves if we don't mention about the diversity symposium that we do with the education system here in within the Lanton Kent District School Board. So we, we've done it for a few years now where because there's so many schools here in Lanton Kent, there's over 51 elementary schools. We were only able to bring one or two students from each school to the museum. And then Shannon would do a presentation as well. Natasha would take the, uh, the educators aside and do a session with them. 
So we're, we're looking forward to planning a virtual one, which means we'll be able to reach a lot further and go throughout Ontario and, and engage a lot more students to take part in this whole day long session about talking about identity and a sense of belonging and understanding um, other people's cultures as well. So we're looking forward to, to developing that. Um, but as, as of now, um, with the SE Dujan lecture, at the end of it, uh, teachers can now register their class to do a live virtual walking tour with myself and my assistant, Jackie, where we'll take you around the property throughout the exhibits here in the museum and uh, talk live with the students and answer their questions and, and really explore how we got here, um, the Underground Railroad, the Black presence here in the province, and, and really give them a good understanding of that. So they can register through the website to do that. So a lot of exciting things that uh, have developed since COVID, and uh, we look forward to uh, partnering with the other panelists on here to, as we continue to develop more programming. Mm. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Queen, uh -huh. uh, yourself in, uh, you know, in Guelph, uh, how have, um, I guess, you know, some of the challenges with COVID, but also how have you adapted, um, you know, Heritage Hall? Yeah, you know, I think one of the best thing about Black people is that they're resilient. And I think we've really learned how to be resilient and creative throughout COVID. Uh, for ourselves at Guelph Black Heritage Society, it is unfortunate that the hall itself has had to be closed for the majority of the time. Um, we've had to work within the parameters of those COVID guidelines and had to work with, you know, modifying based on who's there, whether it's faith-based organizations, dance, yoga. But on the other hand, it's actually probably been one of our most successful years we've seen in 2020. Um, not only in the light of the momentum of the Black Lives Matter movement, but uh, we also worked on running a protest here in solidarity with the BLM movement, which brought a lot of attention onto the Guelph Black Heritage Society and the work that, you know, Denise Francis and so many others have been doing for so long. Um, but it's also brought and amplified our ways of that we're reaching out to people, whether that be through online and virtual resources, which has been actually quite um successful, most surprising, as Stephen said too, like you're always so surprised at how many people end up coming out and wanting to engage and to learn. And I think these are the times right now that people especially want to do that. For us, we also have so many community partnerships that we've been working on between the Guelph Museums, the Guelph Libraries, the um, school boards, uh, community partnerships with small businesses like Royal City Brewery and the Lantern Ale that we came out with a few years back. And I think that, you know, really our next steps are working towards an anti-racism summit in the spring that is going to work on fully educating people from top to bottom. Um, and then also having time to celebrate through like a soca fete for our people who wanna dance and live it up and celebrate because so often this work comes with like that really heavy load. And sometimes you just need to like be able to celebrate and let loose and have a really good time too. Um, so we're really just trying to stay, I think, you know, really relevant looking at TikToks, looking on way to educate people through different platforms and reaching the youth now. And I think that that's where we're going is trying to be a ro more robust organization and reaching out to all community members. Thank you. We're just about to get into questions. So if um, audience, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and we'll get to uh, some of your questions. I wanted to, um, uh, end with the panelists before we get to questions by getting your thoughts, each of your thoughts on what we can do to continue to, what we can do collaboratively um, as historical societies, as heritage sites, uh, community members to advance the preservation of black history sites um, in our province. Uh, it's a, I know it's like a, a, a deep prompt we can do, we can really, that could be a topic in and of itself, but um, I wanted, you know, we're here talking about markers of history and their significance and their relevance and their importance. And so I wanted to close with, uh, you know, motivating thought. We recognize the important work that has to be done in order to invest in these sites, to maintain these sites um, for posterity. And so I wanted each of you to, um, you know, to share your thoughts on that. And I will We'll again come back into the same order. Miss Shannon. You know, I, I'm 
so uh, um, I would love to collaborate. I think, you know, years ago, um, uh, Stephen and I and the folks in Amherstburg and Chatham, we had a, a collaboration with um, the ministry. Remember, Stephen? Um, and they were very um, involved in assisting us because we had a underground railroad network. You know, in Southwest and Central Ontario, they helped us uh, promote. They had booklets. They had training sessions for us um, on how to create packages, marketing. Um, so they were very, very involved at one point. Um, they even hired someone to um, pull things together for us, you know, because we, you know, we only one of us at a site at a time or one and a half a staff. So it's hard. And I think it's hard for for us that don't have that extra support at a site to try and do as much as we would like to do. I think that's one of our biggest issues, mine anyway, trying to to do that. But I think it, you know, and because we at one of the uh, one of the um, events that we did when with the um, ministry with the government the provincial government we did several presentations for the minister of um, education down in London and she was quite in awe of what the sites had to offer and you know uh, and but unfortunately <laughs> she left that. She lost that portfolio. So then now, now you have to re-educate whoever is in that position now. So it's it's unfortunate that there is not someone in a position that can be part of that curriculum to set down, what, you know. Um, and I don't know how that happens, um, you know, to get someone to sit on um, a board or a committee to, to review what is part of the curriculum, what should be included, what is not included. Um, but I think because we have a strong voice and we have a strong presence, so it's just trying to get all of us together to say with plan A and let's go forward. Uh, what that plan is going to look like, um, I don't know, but it would be great. <laughs> uh, and I know... Natasha, you are very, very proactive and you are very involved um, with different boards. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you have done and are doing um, to increase the educational presence uh, within the curriculum. Um, so we really appreciate all of your work. I know I do. And um, so thank you. Thank you. So that's all I got. <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, before I get to Mary Catherine, uh, that you know the the consistency in terms of um, the offices who support um, and fund uh, heritage sites that would be something that would be very important in terms of advancing instead of always starting over, starting over um, from scratch. So thanks for that, Mary Catherine. You could just share your your brief thoughts on what we can do to sure. I don't know if if Lorraine, you want to take this one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. um, sorry, I'm just enthusiastic about collaborations, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think one uh, very simple way that we can collaborate with each other is just to promote each other when visitors come in, because I can't even count the amount of times that I've recommended people go to these other sites because the experience of a freedom seeker or a descendant in, Amber in Amherstburg is going to be completely different, possibly from someone who lived in Buxton or Guelph or Dresden. So in order for them to get this uh, more complete picture, they can't just come to Amherstburg. They can't just go to Buxton or, or Dresden or Guelph. They have to, I think that you need to go to all of the sites and more in order to get this more accurate picture. I think also as well, um, it, I mean, I have to bring in social media because I run our social media pages, but I think even just the simplest thing of promoting our friends, like that's what I say when I share information that have been posted on on their, their pages is our friends at Guelph are doing this, let's help support them. So I think in order to show this solidarity between us, the language that we use, I think, is really important. And I think also reaching out to each other and trying to do things online. I mean, I've collaborated 
uh, with Sam at the, the Black Mecca Museum in Chatham in terms of just creating a game that talks about Black history. And, and we alternated between pages uh, through it. So we found that that was really successful. And so there's there's ways that we can collaborate with each other, even if COVID is, is happening. And we can continue that beyond COVID as well. Thanks, Lurie. Uh, Stephen. Um, so many thoughts going through my head about uh, that topic. Um, yeah. You know <laughs> whose mind is going through? Who's going through my mind is Wilma Morrison, oh, who yeah. passed away recently. Mm -hmm. And we're losing these keepers of the history. Um, Donna Ford, the president of the, I don't know if a lot of the viewers know there's a Central Ontario network for black history. She's the president and they're going to close up their network because there's not support to keep the, that network going. So we really need to, to reach out to the youth and, and find that little seed that's gonna get them engaged in telling our stories and sharing our stories. Cause I, we all know once they get engaged and they hear it, there's so much passion um, within the youth sector. And we really need to, to do our, our part to get them engaged. And I know we're all doing the best we can. Um, we all, I'm sure, will commit, Natasha, to aiding you and the Ontario Black History Society because what are we missing? What is what is the glaring thing that we're missing here in Canada? The and museum. it is a national museum dedicated to black history. And I know that that is top on your list to, to, to see realized. So if there's any way that we as sites can have a unified voice to approach whoever it is, whether it's within government or the private sector, I really think we need to do that. And if you're somebody from the private sector that is watching today, mm -hmm. we got in the United States, we have Oprah, we have all these major corporations, all the auto, big auto uh, makers, they give money to all these black museums in the States. And that's why they have these beautiful, gorgeous facilities. Mm -hmm. We need that. Too, yes, we so. do. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Stephen. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, that is a an important collaboration to continue um to to realize. So thanks for that. Uh, Queen, uh, you have the last word. What could we do or what can and should we do to continue to advance the preservation of your site for our sites? Well, my fellow panelists have echoed it so well, and that's really just keeping the history and the stories going, the ones of those that have not been told, the ones we haven't heard of. Um, who was it? Was it Martin Luther King Jr. that said that we all may have come on different ships, but we're all on the same boat? Was that Martin Luther? I think that's Martin Luther. And and that, that, that quote rings so true with me. While we're on different locations and different areas, we're all on that same journey towards that same end result, which is, you know, ending systemic racism, working towards education, amplifying the voices of black bodies, both male, female, queer, and so on. And I think that that's what collaboration does. And it also allows stories to extend because these journeys aren't just one stop as our lives are not just one stop. Um, you know, I've been in Toronto, I've been in Guelph, I've traveled the world as do the stories of our ancestors. And I think this allows for collaboration and, and more stories to come out of that. Um, and more strength and more unity. Thank you. And yeah, thanks for that, everyone. Uh, I wanted to remind our audience and our panelists about our blog, uh, The Great Humbling. It's a series about the victory and growth amidst one of the most intense moments in our history. We spoke with the Black Ontarians about the ways they are navigating this time uh, of COVID professionally and in some cases personally. Our aim is to contrast the painfully negative narrative being perpetuated in mainstream media, be it the horrors of police brutality, disproportionality, disproportionate rates of um, COVID impact and death, um, or the continued and increased unemployment that we all observe uh, in the cracks of our economy. We also aim for this body of work to serve as a tool of empowerment to Black Canadian communities and to remind them of all the great work that they've been able to accomplish. Through conversation and curation of information, we aim to show the generations to come that all throughout 2020 and beyond, there were many Black Ontarians thriving, achieving their goals, 
creating positive impact and solutions to the challenges that communities faced. I also wanted to, before we get to our questions, remind everyone that we have our third event of our speaker series next week where we will have a storyteller, Sandra Whiting and Kesha Christie, as well as author Yolanda Marshall, who will be with us for a very engaging and dynamic session of storytelling. And with that, I'll thank our panelists and let's get to some of the questions that we have. Um, our first question, um, Michael Kerr. Hi, Michael. It's asked, do any of the sites exhibits explore Christian proselytization, face-based oppression, and the systemic exclusion and suppression of the many forms of traditional Black and African spiritualities? And I'll let open that question. Did anyone have anything for that question? Well, I guess I'll um, speak to, for the Amherstburg Freedom Museum. Um, I mean, it's a really great question. And I mean, it's certainly something that we could consider discussing in the future, but that's not something I myself have uh, looked at. I mean, in terms of religion, I mean, I guess you could look at the fact that the church was attended by Black Canadians, that there that is some form of exclusion in terms of the broader society that they lived in. I mean, one thing to remember for Amherstburg is that it wasn't a, a, a Black settlement. Uh, it was more of freedom seekers and their descendants um, integrating into um, a main mainstream society, I guess you could call it, um, rather than being a specific settlement like the Refugee Home Society or Buxton. So the fact that they did have to form their own churches does speak to some exclusion in terms of not only uh, the, their race, but their religion as well. Um, but uh, that's an excellent question, though, and something that we can definitely consider in the future. Thanks for that. Um, the next question. Sorry, it's just coming up here. Did we have another question for the panelists? While we're waiting for that, Natasha, I, I will, uh, I'm reminded now of Wilma Morris, Morrison, who I mentioned earlier, she did uh, co-author an article in our Heritage Matters magazine about um, religion um, in these early black settlements and touches a little bit on, on the issue of racism. So that might be a, um, a resource for the person who asked the question, Mr. Kerr, um, to just go online and look at our, our archived uh, Heritage Matters articles and you'll find the one there with, uh, with uh, Wilma Morrison. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add um, to a little bit to that uh, there isn't there aren't any more questions um i just wanted to add in looking at the history of the black church in you know in ontario but also broader uh broadly in in, in canada you do get a sense of um you know why some of these churches formed whether it is partially because of racial exclusion, but also because of a preference for, um, you know, for that affinity space um, to, to worship and also to build and foster and nurture community. Um, and also the role that churches have played not only as places of, of spirituality and, and worship, but also uh, integral community organizations that um, offered and provided a range of community supports uh, and programs. And so I think through under explore that exploration of that will help to kind of you know get a sense of some of the ideas and when we get to look at some of the work of some of the the people who were um, leaders in the church uh, such as Josiah Henson and looking at some of their records we get a sense of some of their thoughts and some of the debates and the conversations that they were engaging in at that time. One more and question. Oh, we do have. Natasha, on that note, you need to grab that book behind you, your book on uh, Emancipation Day, because I know you covered that topic in that book. So that was that'd be a good resource for people if they want to explore it a little bit. Further. Yes, thanks for that, Stephen. Yes, what, how, one more question came in before we close, um, and someone can take this question: Was the Underground Railroad an actual under 
underground system where blacks were used were using to escape slavery. So who would like to take that question? I can take that one. Um, so in terms of the Underground Railroad, um, its name comes from it being a secretive network of, of people and places. Um, so not so much an actual physical uh, structure that allow, or a form of transportation that allowed people to to uh, get to Canada. Um, so it was it was a secretive network of, of people and uh, places, churches, uh, homes, and people did really risk their lives uh, in order to get freedom seekers to to Canada. And I mean, even with the fugitive slave law, um, that I mean, we have to remember that it wasn't just the fugitive slave law that brought about the Underground Railroad. It existed before the fugitive slave law of 1850. Um, but with that law, it I, I always say that before the 1850s, it was more of a slower trickle of people coming into Canada. But once 1850 happened, the fugitive slave law made it um, possible for uh, enslavers and bounty hunters to go into free northern states which caused this massive flood. So after 1850, it was more of a massive flood of people uh, coming into, into Canada. So uh, that was what really brought um, more attention, I think, to the Underground Railroad. But we have to, I think it's important to, to remember that uh, it wasn't just 1850 and beyond where there was this mass flood of people. It was, there was people who established themselves uh, long before 1850, and also people who came over uh, into Canada uh, independently of the Underground Railroad, and there were free Black people who came over as well, too. I think sometimes we um, narrow our focus in terms of the Underground Railroad to think that it was only people coming into Canada uh, through the Underground Railroad, but there were free people who were free long before uh, they came over to Canada. And uh, so the, the idea of the Underground Railroad, that is one uh, form of entry into into Canada, but there were other ways as well where free, free people and freedom seekers came independently of the Underground Railroad as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so a couple of questions have come in. Um, do either sites, and I'll kind of trim this question here, do either sites have resources available in French? I'll say we do. Our, our exhibit all the text that you see on the walls and the panels and out in the buildings, that's all in both French and English. As a, uh, a provincial agency, we are um, bound to do that with all of our interpretation. So I'm happy to say that we do have that. I will clarify that though, I don't speak French. So uh, when we do the live tours, it's just an English only presentation. Okay, anyone else? Thank you, I know, go ahead. I was just going to say, we do have a few things that are offered in French because there are some French language schools that come to the museum. Um, so we've got our uh, scavenger hunt activities that have been translated into French as well as um, a French language translation of one of the videos that we show to the students when they visit here. I, I do want to say, and thanks for that, I do want to say that that is an additional um, cost for sites or for historical societies. And so if you are largely volunteer based or have a quite a limited budget, that can be um, one of the challenges to making your resources and materials more accessible. But it's something that you know all sites would want to be able to, to offer. So thanks for that. Another question, I have two more questions before we go. Um, what is, I guess, what is, an early, one of the earliest artifacts of Black Canadian um, history that I guess each of your site has encountered or has uh, an artifact or a testimony. Um, so at the Amherstburg Freedom Museum, um, I would say uh, our oldest artifact or one of the oldest is, um, it's got a really, um, brutal history, but I think it's really necessary to sh share with people. It's an iron ring that uh, was, so there, to give some context, um, obviously we, we know that Canada had slavery as well, and there were enslavers in Amherstburg as well, and one of them was Matthew Elliott, who frustratingly is, is often celebrated as a military hero. Um, the plaque in front of his um, property actually celebrates his military contributions, but doesn't talk about him being an enslaver, which frustrates myself and Mary Catherine to, to no end. Um, but in uh, in the museum, we make, sh make it a point to share um, an iron ring that was embedded in a tree on his property that was used to tie up enslaved persons and, and punish them. And I think that that is 
I always because I always bring that that point up when people ask, well, the numbers weren't as high in in Canada, so it must not have been that bad. And so I think having this 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 artifact, this representation of the brutality of enslavement, I think is an important uh, thing to share with with people who come through the museum uh, because it really does show that although the numbers were not as high, it was just as brutal as in the United States and how we need to look to our own history, to, to Canadian history, rather than looking to the US to tell our own history. So uh, that's the artifact that we do often share. That's mm -hmm. the oldest. Uh, just for the sake of time, I, I will, I mean, that would be, I think, one of the oldest artifacts um, that all of the sites, you know, would have. And, and just to touch on to say that, you know, with when you talk about the numbers, um, the title of my dissertation research is One Too Many, because it really does disrupt this view that, you know, looking at the history of enslavement mm -hmm. in Canada, that, you know, we have to focus on the individual lives of the, the humanity of these people and not focus on, you know, the difference in, in numbers. Um, so thanks for that. The last question that we have is what needs to be done to include honest and complete history, including black history? In the <coughs> so which one person, which one panelist would like to take that last question? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the man is turning in. You always be ready for it. <laughs> No, no, I wasn't, <laughs> because I think I spoke about you know, the, the curriculum component earlier, how, um, and I guess when you were talking about collaboration earlier, I guess that's what I was, I had in my head, because I know we all support each other at collaboratively um, anyway, but I guess when my mind, I was thinking the curriculum, but again, I think it's because it, in order for us to get it there, we need to really petition um, everyone and get a seat someplace somehow to say this needs to be uh, included, basically to have a voice at that table. Um, and I think Natasha is that voice. So let's vote Natasha in there. Uh, how that's going to get done, again, I, I honestly don't know uh, what those proper channels are, um, but I think that's that's how it's going to happen and put pressure. And I think and I think now is the time because because of everything that has happened because it, it is it is it's so long overdue. So strike while the iron's hot. So I vote Natasha. Well, I'd say everyone, you know, as voters, as citizens, as parents and community members, we could lend our voice, let yes. our MPs know. Yeah, we want to let the Ministry of Education know what it is that we expect to see um, in our curriculum. Our curriculum needs to be reflective of our communities and our province, and so we need to encourage them um, forcefully to make that happen and make that a reality. I wanted to express my sincere appreciation to all of you uh, for joining us this evening in this conversation. I miss all of you in person um, and looking forward to seeing you again, but continue the amazing work that you're doing in honoring the memory of our ancestors and preserving these historic sites for us to continue to have in our, you know, in our sites, in our visions and, and in, our, in our communities. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, please do join us again for our third um, event of our speaker series next week. And again, thank you to our lead sponsor, TD Bank, and our silver sponsor, um, the ECFO uh, Union. So thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. The Black History Month Speaker Series would like to thank our sponsors. TD Canada Trust offers a range of financial services and products to more than 10 million Canadian customers, and the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario encourages a year-long focus on Black history as an integral part of learning about Canadian history and current issues. Thank you for seeing our vision. We look forward to the future.